Um, so, anybody know what this is? Any guesses? We'll get to that in a second. So, um, I, I, I run two food companies. One's called Pilot R&D, one's called Render. Um, my, co -founder, my co founders and I started Pilot um, as a consultancy. So, we all came from the very refined and strange world of fine dining restaurant R&D. So, my partners and I, at one point or another, were working with half or more of the three Michelin starred restaurants in North America. And uh, what we took out of that world was not, um, you know, the key to selling more potato chips is Americans need to wake up to the wonders of clove and anchovies and the pairing that they bring. It's not, it wasn't about esoteric ingredients. It was about ruthless problem solving. Because when you're in a crazy restaurant and you're working on innovation timelines of days or weeks or sometimes hours rather than years or decades, um, you, you cannot just be looking for the silver bullet. It's not let me call up the company that makes the modified starch and figure out what's going to solve my sauce. It's looking at every possible aspect of a piece of food and figuring out how to make it work. And um, we also have a background in science. Um, so I, I did a PhD in mashed potatoes um, in food biochemistry, which that's what this is. These are uh, raw starch granules in a Yukon gold potato. Um, and they're here to teach us a bunch of lessons. Um, so we, we combined this level of food with this chefy level of food to create what we call culinary science, which is, uh, it's like food science with a purpose. <laughs> Apologies to all my fellow food scientists in the room. Um, food science is great, but um, food science is a fundamental, very reductive platform on which development can happen. It is not the engine that will take you on the path of development. Um, I studied mashed potatoes um, with some very fancy chefs who had a lot of insight into mashed potatoes. And uh, it took us about six months now. It took us about three months to get to the point where we understood the mechanisms that were at play in making the world's most delicious mashed potatoes, um, which is great for Thanksgiving and impressing in-laws. Um, for the next four years, uh, I spent a lot of time figuring out exactly how this worked so that we could prove the exact little tiny bit of biochemistry that is responsible for gumminess and mashed potatoes. And the mashed potatoes got 0% better in those extra four years after that first three months of development. So one of the things that I, I, I kind of want to talk about in the context of a food robotics summit is that, I, I, I've now said this a few times, but food is very, very dumb compared to robots. Um, food is incredibly complex, but f food is cumbersome, unyielding, and frustratingly like ornate in a way that does not lend itself well to innovation. So starch is going to starch. It, it doesn't matter if um, a, a three Michelin star chef is handling this starch or if the biggest food company in the world is throwing hundreds of millions of dollars at turning this starch into a chicken wing. It doesn't matter if a $10 million robot and uh, all kinds of sensors and, and indicators are peering into the soul of what this starch has to offer. It's still gonna interact with water the same way. It's still gonna interact with heat the same way. There is a very, very low ceiling on the actual materials innovation that can happen in the world of food. And that's unique when we talk about robotics. When, when you're working with semiconductors and you're working with polymers and you're working with alloys, there's, that, that's a bunch of like inorganic, inorganic chemistry that I don't understand. But there is so much more you can do with it because we don't have to put it inside of us, uh, at least not eating it. Um, and so the biggest limitation on what we can do in food by the way, this is, if you've ever wondered what happens when you cook a potato, cells, starch, we'll come back to that. Um, the, the biggest limitation on what can happen in food comes down to the fact that this is it. This is our toolkit. This is the beginning and end of it. We will never create something new. There will be five minutes for questions when we're done. Um, anytime somebody starts with any sort of profound TED Talkian language saying we're going to revolutionize something, something, something 
that ends in food, this is your, this is your bullshit litmus test. This is your, this is your pH meter. Um, these are the building blocks of food, and these are it. Um, I did not invent these. These have been around. Um, I got a comic book illustrator to paint them. Um, water, sugars, carbs. Sugars are a kind of carb, but they behave in very, very little ways in the same, so we separated them. Uh, lipids, which is fat, oils, anything greasy. Proteins, which is the sexiest thing in the world currently. Minerals, gases, and heat. Um, it does not matter if you create some, if you mastered cold fusion and you were able to create a self-sustaining generator that could produce more clean burning heat than any burner had ever created in, in the history of mankind, it would not make water behave any differently than it does now. No matter how much heat or how you deliver that heat, whether it's dragon fire or a butane burner, water is going to do this. And unless you put a lid on escaping water molecules as stuff steams, you're never going to get it above the boiling point at wherever you are unless you add pressure. So that one really simple thing is, I think, I have no insider information, how we got like the KFC pressure fryer, where Kentucky Fried Chicken was trying to figure out how to fry chicken faster. The problem is, no matter how hot you make your fryer, all that's going to do is take heat to the surface of the food. From there, that heat is probably just going to go right the other way into the atmosphere when water takes it away as, as boiling water. So they were like, all right, the way we can fry faster is turning a fryer, no pressure cooker. And that, that was kind of it. Um, when we look at sugar, sugar is going to cause stuff to brown. Sugar is going to preserve things. So we work a lot with CPG companies. And right now, sugar is uh, Freddy Krueger, and it is lurking in the corners of all of our dreams, and sugar will kill us all. And we're questing for these holy grails of how to get something that has all of the delicious taste, texture, and visual appeal of like really good gelato, but with zero sugar. And the problem is sugar is not just responsible for sweetness, it's responsible for all of these things at once. And so anytime you try to pull that wholesale out of your food, we get right back into where we were in the 90s when fat was the problem. Um, I ask this at almost every conference I go to. Who in here has eaten a bag of Alestra fried potato chips? 90s? Yes? There was, does, everybody, does everybody know where I'm going with this? <laughs> Alestra is a fat-like substance that one of the problems with fat is that it has nine calories per gram. And it, uh, a minute on the lips, a lifetime on the hips. That, whoever came up with that phrase should be accused of war crimes. Um, it's psychologically damaging. Um, so uh, fat has calories. Fat is very calorie dense. If only we could have something that you could have creamy emulsions and you could have um, uh, storage for aromas and you, you could have capture all the magic of a sour cream and onion potato chip, but without any of the weird inefficiencies of nutrition, um, that would be great. And so we came up with Alestra. By we, I mean the royal we. I had nothing to do with it. Um, and Olestra was something that could not be digested by your uh, tract quite the same way, so it was very low calorie, but it could also not be digested by your tract the same way, so it was very low enjoyment after eating, um, and it caused profound gastric distress. We are potentially going right back to that with all of this stuff that we are eating in massive quantities instead of sugar. <laughs> um, so anybody out there who is pitching you from an ingredient company uh, something that behaves exactly like sugar, but with a quarter of the calories, and you use it one for one exactly like sugar, like the right here part of you should be skeptical of that, because we will all be in a few years. So all, all I'm trying to get at with that is these patterns of how food behaves hold the keys to making robotics relevant to food. Um, we can do incredible things with machines, and it, it, it's, it's so beyond my pay grade that it's, it's, it's laughable. We can do incredible things with machines, but we cannot outstrip the shortcomings that are built into food. We can make machines that can interact with food and do things that are arguably better than what human beings can do, that are more precise, that are um, more reproducible, that uh, I think in the, in the intro it says, like, won't take a sick day or a cigarette break. Um, that's great. But no one, man or machine, can overcome this side of food. So I guess my only request is that we engage with this 
as a community of really brilliant and inspiring and inspired people who are going to be shaping how machines interact with food to just remember that the food is going to call the shots. And so if you are going to launch a fried chicken robot that does, uh, has drones that fly you fried chicken uh, hot and ready to you, and you haven't figured out how to have water and crispy dehydrated carbohydrates sit next to each other in juicy chicken meat and crispy chicken breading and not contaminate each other, if you haven't solved that fundamental bit of cold fission, fusion, there's a physicist in the room somewhere, uh, you have no company. And so I, that's, this is not to say that there's doom and gloom. This is not to say that there is no future here. There is a smarter future here where everybody who's thinking about getting into robotics and food can sort of pick their shots with a more informed head of steam. Um, if, if we get through this, and we're going to go back to our parable of starch, but if, if, if we had listened to starch in the, in the beginning, uh, we would not still be talking about 3D printing as something that we might get to happen where we're 3D printing food. Um, 3D printing is fascinating. 3D printing relies on um, things that are very homogenous, that can be mixed together and have a phase change. Foods that can do that are pretty much pure sugar and a couple of different kinds of fat. So for creating very ornate wedding toppers and um, stuff with cocoa butter, 3D printing could be really cool. 3D printing a pizza is an idea that would be put forth by someone who has never rolled out pizza dough or has never seen a dough sheeter or has never seen a uh, already industrialized setup for making pizza because forming a circle out of dough is not the hardest part of commercializing pizza and producing it consistently and in, in, in large scale. So I, I, that's, that was, that's the main part of the, uh, the tirade and the juice. Um, but, but the idea is we, we can learn from this and we can funnel all of these resources and these great ideas and frankly all this money and time into things that have a higher chance of success rather than just what sounds good. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. Yeah, I, we have a couple, couple minutes for questions, um, which I'm sure there, there must be a couple. I came in hot. I, I don't mean to scare. Yeah. 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 How much can the experimentation improve? That's a great question. So uh, the question was, as somebody who's looked into food science, w what is the role of experimentation and how much undiscovered territory is there? There's a lot. Like, again, not a mathematician, but the permutations of all of these things together and how they can interact, are m they are many. Um, the fundamental patterns, these things where like the, the rules of pH are, are pretty much static. Um, there's not a lot of innovation that we can do. We're, we're not really going to be coming up with new acids, new, new forms of acidifying that human beings can eat on a regular basis and, and digest. That is not to say that we're, gonna, we're not going to come up with new situations in which we would like to enjoy consuming acidic food or um, new ways, in, I don't know, if you can make a robot that could do uh, a la minute pickling. Um, that's great, and, th and there, there is plenty of room for experimentation and pushing the horizons. It's just the horizons are shaped differently with food than with almost any other field, primarily because of us and what we can tolerate and what we can consume and the fact that everything is going to come down to being made out of these same building blocks. Does that, does that make sense? Like, we, we have a company that's like an R&D experimentation company. We, we hope to remain in business. Um, there's tons of new stuff, but anytime somebody comes up and they're like, we're going we're gonna to reinvent food, we're going to create flavors that have never been created before, it's a lot of buzzwords. Um, and, and that is not to say that there's not uncharted territory. It's just territory nearer to home than, than is sexy to think about sometimes. Yes? That's great. So 
if if you guys buy my bullshit that we have one toolkit and and let's take this as an assumption, what are the what's the lowest hanging fruit? Um, some of the lowest hanging fruit, literally and figuratively, is uh, to let fruit be fruit. Um, we we talk a lot about uh, getting to know the person personality of of a given food ingredient or or dish. If you're looking at a calzone, getting to understand what the fundamental mechanisms at play within that food are and not stretching it too far. So um, if somebody wants to make uh, a high protein, low sugar thing with robotics or otherwise, um, probably trying to make that high sugar, low protein thing out of just blueberries is not the best way to do it because blueberries carry a sugar baggage embedded in that flavor profile that's gonna be hard to communicate with just whey protein. Um, and so that, that, that is sort of part of it, is understanding what of these a given substrate is made of and allowing it to lean into its own lane rather than trying to turn it completely around. Because you can turn it completely around and you can turn plants into chicken wings. It just costs like hundreds of millions of dollars. Whereas creativity and talking to a chef uh, or, or somebody in, in this way is comparatively much cheaper. <laughs> Great question. Um, any others? Yes. In in the robotic space? Uh, oh, in food R and D. Yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, it's it. There are not a lot of us as established companies. I mean, there's like Matson, there's Chew Labs. Um, everybody out there that is doing it, I, I think has found a really good niche. Like you look at um, like our client base, you look at their client bases, um, they, they find a lane and they, and they do really good work in it. Um, it is an interesting interest industry because there is way more than enough work to go around. I don't know that we, we find ourselves like bidding for projects against people, or maybe we're just not being told that we're being compared to those people, but it, it's not a thing where there is all this cutthroat, who's gonna solve the food R&D problem first. It's more just how, what kind of style you want to have that experience. Um, one of the things that I am always cautious of is somebody who is very firmly grounded only in culinary or very firmly only grounded in food science. And I'm not saying everybody has to be hybrid, but those multidisciplinary teams are often so much more effective at solving weird problems, whereas chefs are really good at helping you figure out stuff that's gonna be executed in a restaurant with humans. Food scientists are very good at helping you figure out very fundamental um, small pieces of the puzzle at one time. Um, it's hard for either of those to swim out of that depth um, effectively across a lot of uh, different types of food. And that's where those like cross-disciplinary teams, like somebody like Matson, has people who have culinary experience, they have food science experience, and together they can you know, do more than just a salad dressing. Um, and I think that's always gonna be the key and just as, as having just said that, having at least a chef or a food scientist involved in the conversation rather than just engineers and marketing people has to be day one. Because um, that's the other thing is having these conversations early, I cannot stress enough how much cheaper it is to point the ship in the right direction rather than pull it like 100 miles from where it's already traveled. Um, and, and just asking somebody once, hey, is this even remotely feasible? Um, could have saved a lot of maybe failed attempts at things in the past. Um, yeah, that's, that's it for me. Thank you guys so much.